And so with that, I would like to introduce Juliet Elprin to moderate the next panel. And um, Juliet is no stranger to Chow. She's been with us uh, for a number of times before, and we're delighted to have her back. Uh, many of you know Juliet as a born and bred Washingtonian. Uh, she joined the Washington Post in 1998 as its reporter for the House of Representatives. She then covered the environmental um, issues for the Post for nine years, and now she's covering the White House. In 2011, she won the Peter Benchley Ocean Award for Excellence in Media, which is a great honor. And uh, it's no coincidence that she's a big fan of sharks, and her newest book, <laughs> Demon Fish, Travels Through the World with Sharks was published in 2011, and it was a book that we featured a couple of years ago as part of our author's coffee. So we're delighted to have Juliet back, and I'm going to turn the panel over to her. Thank you, Thanks Juliet. Thanks so much. Thanks, Justin. So um, we have a fantastic panel up here, um, and what, what I like is we have, we have different I'm, I'm not even. I'm not going to call them factions, but we have we have different segments that are related to uh, the ocean. We have anglers. We have ocean industries. We have you know uh, former navy. We have we have two Rhode Island partisans on our panel because we have both Senator Sheldon Whitehouse and I think it won't surprise you when when I was asked to switch beats, I thought I was going to be asked to solely cover Senator Whitehouse and that's why I agreed to the beat switch and then was later told actually President Obama was the primary person who I now am supposed to follow around but I'm still hoping to you know alter that somewhat. Um, uh, Jim Moriarty from uh, the CEO of the Surfrider uh, Foundation learned, learned to love the ocean by going to Rhode Island, is that not correct? That's true. Um, and then, of course, and so, and then we have uh, Andy Rosenberg be, do, be doing the science. So we really have um, a whole range of, 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 of folks here. Um, and I, I think it gives you a sense of, of these are people, whether you're talking about uh, Mike Nussman um, from the American Sport Fisting Association, um, or, or if you have Randall Luthi, who is now president and CEO of the National Ocean Industries Association. but. Um, has uh, has served both in the mineral man uh, management service as well as in fish and wildlife and 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 actually in NOAA too. So you really you've got the whole gamut. So um, so we really have you know a wide range of people who have connections to the ocean. So um, so I'm going to throw out an opening question again, and we are really lucky to have Senator Whitehouse who um, started the oceans the bipartisan oceans caucus in the Senate, co-founded the Safe Climate Caucus. A bicameral institution and has focused as the senator from the ocean state on ocean issues from from the very beginning and was wise enough to marry a marine biologist um, Sandra who's where I really attribute all of his uh, ocean knowledge to <laughs> originally but but he really he needs to keep up with her which is why he basically focuses on these issues so um, so with that um, I want to start with since you know we have a member of the Pew Commission um, Roger Roof here as well if we could talk about Given the decade that we've seen, where do we think we are compared to a decade ago in terms of the oceans and where are we headed? If we have to assess where we think perhaps we've made the most progress in terms of, of ocean issues and kind of some of the new challenges that we're confronting, um, I'd love to just start by throwing that out and seeing who would like to to weigh in. Maybe I'm going to put Roger on the spot. I guess make make him go since you're on the commission. Well, I'm kind of a glass half full kind of a guy, and I think in terms of the Pew Oceans Commission, which I was on, we've really in the last couple of years have come quite a ways. I think there's some positive good news to talk about. The national ocean policy that we advocated has now been issued by the president. There's an implementation plan that was finalized just a year ago, and that contains something like 213 very specific directions to various members of the, uh, the uh, administration. Uh, that directs specific actions to responsible agencies by a certain time over the next couple of years. Uh, it emphasizes ecosystem-based management, which I think was a term that wasn't even being discussed hardly 10 years ago, uh, which is another very strong point. Um, it, it recognized the need to have regional uh, ocean councils, plannings, uh, ocean planning uh, bodies, which have been implemented in the Northeast and in, in uh, the Atlantic. and. Uh, uh, importantly, I think another uh, word that wasn't, didn't pass anybody's lips t without a lot of uh, consternation a few years ago, particularly among some in the, in, the, um, in the industry, was the idea of marine spatial planning. You know, we talked about marine protected areas, now it's more of a marine spatial, spatial, spatial planning uh, uh, lexicon, which I think is a better way to frame it, but a good way of looking at how we have to manage our oceans using ecosystem-based management in the future. So I think that's, that's all good news. 
I, uh, I know that the senator has been one of the ones who's been trying to get funding for all this stuff, and that remains a, a significant challenge to, to implement all these things with funding. Uh, so that's something that's still out there and needs to be addressed. And then finally, the only thing I'd say is on the, on the negative side is that we seem, to, uh, we seem to not learn our lessons very well over time. You know, we, we, uh, we, we do all these things in terms of policy and, and in terms of good, uh, good um, uh, steps forward, but then you have uh, something like the, uh, ex the, um, the Deepwater Horizon spill, which shows us that as we learn these lessons through these disasters that we face over time, those lessons only last for a year or two, and then we don't adopt them into, our, into the way we manage things in the future. And we've got to do a better job of that. Okay. Yes, Jim. I want to jump on that because uh, I actually think a little bit of the inverse in terms of the deep water spill. Um, I think one of the differences, at least from my perspective, is that in the last decade, we now have brands that have been established around environmental disasters. So whether it's Katrina, the BP spill, Fukushima, or even Sandy, those are in people's lexicon, and it's connected them to something that it didn't seem like people were as connected to before. Hmm. I have friends both in Japan and in Oregon experiencing the Fukushima. I think people are more connected. The A-train was underwater. Bloomberg was in, you know, it, it was news for months. It still is. I think there are brands that are established and passed around media because they're packaged well. They're less than 140 characters, and you can connect. Interesting. Andy, yeah, you had. So I think there has been um, some significant change uh, since the I was on the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy. Um, and I agree with much of what uh, Admiral Roof said uh, with regard to some of the issues that have emerged. I also think there's been very significant changes in management of fisheries. I think there's been a change in the attitude towards protected areas and the need for protected areas and the consequences of protected areas. I think there has been some significant change over the last decade in uh, market-based efforts to deal with oceans issues, particularly fisheries, or tuna or or um, other species, and that argues for some public awareness. As imperfect as all of those measures are, there are significant changes. We're not really any longer arguing about whether you should manage fisheries. You still get the same constituent screaming, but um, you know fundamentally there's been a shift in the way that fisheries have been managed. Um, but on the other side, I would say that um, the awareness of uh, climate impacts is dramatically different from a decade ago. And the fact that um, those climate impacts are eff effectively filtering through to everything mm -hmm. in the ocean and on land, for that matter, um, is, is dramatically different. And so I think there now is a very strong sense, certainly within the science community and in many in, in uh, the policy community and some of the public, that um, without dealing with climate, we're not even treading water. Um, and it, it's interesting to me that while we talk about climate science and the fight over climate science in every field of science that I'm aware of, natural sciences, certainly um, from ecology and many, you know, envir environmental economics, many other fields, you have to consider climate. Um, it's not just the climate scientists who are talking about this. And then finally, I'd say there is a change in the international community that we have not fully utilized to make changes internationally um, for the betterment of the oceans. So there are changes in the European Union, there's changes in Japan, there's changes uh, certainly in Australia and New Zealand which provide great opportunity to do something different in the oceans. The U.S. is could be leading, um, still has some barriers of not signing on to many of the U.N. instruments like the Law of the Sea or the Convention on Biological Diversity, but there is a real opportunity because those international changes have occurred. This is not a U.S.-centric change that's occurred around the oceans. Even things such as marine spatial planning and, and ecosystem-based management, there's just as much happening internationally or more in many cases as there is in the U.S. Um, and there's an opportunity to really make a difference, and that's different from 10 years ago. Senator Whitehouse, I was just wondering, as someone who tries to bridge between these different worlds and actually both talks to scientists and then tries to integrate it into policy, public policy discussions, what's your sense of where we are on some of these issues? I think we're making uh, a lot of 
progress. I think the oceans are emerging as um, a significant public policy issue. Um, one example is that uh, I understand that in his very first staff meeting after he became Secretary of State, in that meeting, he said, we're going to do stuff on oceans. And uh, today, uh, Secretary Kerry had a high-level meeting to kind of help frame the direction of that. Um, we have agreed in the Congress, in the Senate, on three issues to work on in the bipartisan uh, Oceans Caucus, which is, uh, to what you said, it's, it's baby steps, but those are important steps. Um, I agree that you can do everything except deal with carbon, and you will not have solved the problem. We absolutely have to solve the carbon problem. And um, my message there is that we should, obviously, we must indeed, and I believe we can, and actually I think we can a lot sooner than most people expect. Um, but we do need real leadership out of the administration on the executive side because Congress is to a very significant degree bought and paid for by the polluting interests. So um, the executive branch has much more freedom to move, and they can, and I hope soon they will. And then uh, there's a huge latent army that is out there waiting for leadership to do something about climate. Everything from the bulk of the electric utility industry to the property casualty insurance industry to the national security establishment to big chunks of the faith community, the hunting community, the fishing community, and assembling those divisions into uh, the kind of army that can make the difference um, is very doable. All of that stuff is very doable. And so I think we could be talking about this in a very serious way much more quickly than most people believe. The fundamental truth of this is that the denial position about climate is not tenable. It is a phony position. It cannot withstand scrutiny. It is entirely bogus. And it has virtually no friends left other than a select small group of cranks and extremists and people who are paid for. So all you really need, I think, is an intense spotlight put on it. And it kind of has to, let's say it's a night blooming plant. And with sunshine, it sh shrivels. <coughs> Um, Randall, I know you wanted to wait. Oh, I just, uh, as we talk about the last 10 years, I think one of the things that has changed is a certainly a more worldwide recognition of the great uh, opportunity and benefit that the oceans provide the world. Uh, our particular group, we're National Ocean Industries Association, which means uh, basically uh, we represent companies that develop energy in the outer continental shelf or the oceans. And that's one of the things we've noticed worldwide is there's a greater acceptance, there's a greater support uh, for all forms of energy development. Not only the, the wind, wave, and current, but uh, across the world, much greater support for oil and gas operations as well. Because one of the things that hasn't changed is that if we look at our energy needs in the year 2035, EIA just put out a, not too long ago, put out a, their best pro pro projection of what the energy use would be. Uh, your traditional forms, coal, oil, that you know seem to scare a lot of people, coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear, still be about 85% of the U.S. energy portfolio. <coughs> now, you could double, and I'm not saying that we should or should not, but I think it's a great idea. You could double the renewable, the non-traditional forms of energy, which is probably faster than it can grow, but you would still be dealing with probably 80% 80, 80 uh, oil and gas is 58% of what that mix. And the rest of the world has recognized that the outer continental shelf and the offshore worlds are a great source for that. The United States, we have been developing the oil and gas areas in the same 13%, the same 13% of the outer continental shelf that we did back in 1973. And while other nations have opened up their areas, we have not. And I think that's one of the things we need to discuss about that and how coastal marine spatial planning may or may not play a role in that. Uh, again, it's part of our future. It's part of our present. We may very well be a nation and a world headed towards a more renewable form of energy. I think everyone thinks that's the case. But the reality, it's not going to happen tomorrow. And we've got to make that bridge 
and oil and gas and our more traditional forms of energy are going to be a part of that for our foreseeable future. Right. And Mike, can we talk fisheries for a minute? We'll and talk say, fisheries, and, yeah. And, and say um, where, where you feel like things have changed and where, where, you know, they, where I, they haven't since then. I think we can look at the fisheries world, the, the saltwater fisheries world, and say that's a, a, an area where we've made tremendous progress in the last, certainly since 1996, two times ago when the Magnuson Act was reauthorized. You know, if you look back at, at assessments, stock assessments, right. and other indicators of abundance of fish, fisheries, uh, we were in not terribly good shape in the early 90s, mid 90s, and, and we've changed all that. And we've right. moved from the position of having a ton of stocks overfish to uh, a, a place where we've got many of our stocks back where they need to be. We're not completely there yet, but we've, we've, certainly, we've certainly moved in a very, very, very positive direction. I think the earlier panel that talked about you know, future fisheries spoke on that, that very issue. But I, I guess that's just, to me, if we had made as much progress on all these issues as we've made within fisheries, we'd be in pretty good shape. So I, I think that's, right. I mean, it's one we care most about. Right. Uh, and is there a reason we why we you focus think, more time on Right. And is there a reason why you think it, I mean, again, first of all, you had a, a very clear law that also got, you know, amended in various ways and that made it easier. But are there other reasons why you think that that issue was, was kind of easier to make advances on than some of, some of the other tough issues that that the ocean still face? Uh, I think, number one, there was a general understanding of the problems that were out there. I think there was a general agreement that it was, in fact, a problem. And, you know, I, I have to say, I wish we could have done it in a way that perhaps had fewer jobs lost in the process, and I think we perhaps could have done that. But nonetheless, we knew what needed to be done, and we did it in, in a, in, you know, sort of bit the bullet and went and did it. And I, so... I, I think that would be my answer. We just right. could, uh, we could identify the problem, and we were all pretty much coalesced around solving it. Right. Got it. And oh, yeah, sorry, Andy, as someone who was involved in some of these discussions, what would you? So want to yeah, on? I mean, in particular on fisheries, I agree that there's been a big change, as I said before. But I think the point about so why did it happen in the mm -hmm. mid '90s? And I was the fishery manager in New England in the mid '90s, so um, got yelled at enough. Um, was that fundamentally the stocks had collapsed. And so if we want to take a lesson, I hope we don't do the same thing with energy. I mean, I think we can do um, what Randall said, which is basically keep the same strategy and assume that we'll have 80 to 85 percent of our um, energy coming from um, oil and gas or fossil fuel resources, or we can have a real strategy so that we don't get to that point in climate or, or other, um, for other reasons. I mean, if we want to assume that things will remain constantly and there'll be a slow growth of, of other sources, then I think that will play out. Um, that's different from trying to do something fundamentally different, which is change the way that we use energy, change the places that we get energy, and plan for that transition. But I think the description of saying we're going to have 85% of it would be a little bit like saying in New England, as some people did in fisheries um, in the early 90s, well, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing, even though the stocks have collapsed or something has happened. Well, something's happening. Climate impacts are happening. So if we keep doing what we're doing, um, then we will get to a point of, of not just, you know, the, the kinds of storms we're seeing or sea level rise we're seeing or warming of the ocean we're seeing. We'll push that to a limit. And I don't think that's the way that we should strategize the future. So the precipitating event in fisheries was a number of places where the system of let's just keep going was no longer tenable. And I'm, by the way, I'm going to keep asking a couple questions, but we are passing around. If people have questions, they can put them on index cards, and there'll be people circulating to pick them up, because I think particularly with a really informed audience like this, it's very helpful to get your, your questions in there. So my next question has to do with technology. And it's, it's interesting, I was talking to a friend of mine, a fellow journalist, who's actually thinking of doing a story, a magazine story, on the fate of the northern uh, North Atlantic right whale, obviously critically endangered species. You know, through basically the technology, the, you know, the technological advances that allowed whaling uh, to succeed years ago is you know in terrible shape. And he's interested in exploring the issue of whether, in some ways, technology can save 
this whale. And again, obviously, many of you do work that intersects with this, this idea that can you, can you basically track where the whales are going through and have marine spatial planning so you don't have the same level of ship strikes that have been so, you know, so terrible for whales in the past. You know, they used to spend all this time doing, detain you know, kind of trying to untangle the whales from nets. And obviously, again, they still do that, but they're, they're trying to figure out if, if they can essentially through, through mapping, you know, avoid these interactions, whether it's with uh, fishing vessels or with, you know, say, shipping. And so, you know, it is a really interesting question of how technology has advanced our understanding of the oceans <coughs> and to what extent has it become one of the real drivers of solutions to some of our problems. So I would be interested in getting people's thoughts on where they see kind of maybe some of the best, you know, opportunities or potential limits on that. Um, so I'll jump in on, on uh, marine spatial planning, which is essentially a technology. Um, to a degree, it's a little bit of a stale technology, which is what everybody has in their home states on the ground already, which is GIS mapping that shows for where your electric lines, where your gas lines, where your floodplains, where your velocity zones, where your highways, you know, you sort of stack all that stuff up and people keep track of that and information is valuable. We have less of it in the oceans and so the key to uh, what I think is an unfortunately named process Right. But if you can come up with it, it's, it's one of the most boring phrases. Yeah, that and I kind of alarming. Of. Almost, maybe, you know, it's a tie between that and ecosystem-based management. Right. So if you yeah, come up a, with a new phrase, a, let we'll, me know. we'll look for it. You could call it ocean zoning. That gets I, everybody th excited. Then people that, freak yeah, out. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good one. Just throw some, <laughs> throw some gasoline on the fire. But basically, it's about information. And uh, one of the really good examples is that when they were having a lot of whale strikes off of Boston Harbor, the first instinct was, well, we're going to slow all the boats down leaving Boston Harbor to a speed that allows whales to get out of the way. Well, that slows things down quite a lot. Turns out that's kind of an expensive idea. So then there was a big fight over that, and somebody actually sat down and mapped where the whale strikes were happening. It turns out there was a channel through where most of the whale strikes were happening that if you moved the... Uh, exit channel from Boston Harbor up just a few degrees, you skipped uh, most of the whale strikes because there, were, there was a geographic, an underwater geographic basis for where the whales were gathering. So easy. Get the information, identify the problem, solve it. That I think is kind of marine spatial planning at its best and it is the application of real information to a problem and there are very few fields of human endeavor where applying real information to a problem doesn't make the solution better. If I, if I might jump on that one, because I want to agree with the senator, and I don't always get an opportunity to do that, so uh, I definitely want to take this opportunity. But information is the key, and I think that's why you're going to see a lot of industry uh, people that are concerned about coastal and marine spatial planning, because there are decisions that could be made without information. 87% of the Outer Continental Shelf hasn't even been looked at in terms of sufficient seismic testing to even get an idea for, of what might, might, and let me underline might, be there for over 30 years. So any kind of decision, about, particularly when you're dealing with uh, oil and gas and possibly wind even to some degree on how you, you uh, anchor those facilities in, you need more information. And that's one of our big concerns is, again, this area, these areas haven't been looked at for two generations. We have more sophisticated ways to look. We shouldn't be making a lot of decisions without knowing what the potential is. Okay, yes, I'll mention, oh, I'll wait, mention an, another thing just to follow up on that. Sometimes it's man-made information going both ways. So in the examples of, I think it was Charleston Harbor and Delaware Bay, <coughs> where the people selling wind farm rights laid the sail grid right over the channel out of the harbor. So that obviously isn't going to be a very successful. That's the question of one hand not knowing what the other is doing. Um, in Rhode Island, we just got the approval from Interior mm -hmm. for the lease of our offshore right. wind farms. And that process is now underway. It's done. And it's just a question of getting the bids and moving forward. In Rhode Island, we have gone through that process far faster than anybody else. We've caught up and passed people who are well ahead of us because we had a really robust marine spatial planning effort that brought everybody to the table, so all the information was there. It's not efficient, 
to go through your process and then find out that you left somebody out and now they've got a grievance and you've got to go back all over again. It's better to bring everybody to the table and work as rapidly and effectively as you can. So uh, from that business perspective, the folks who are interested in putting wind farms up off of Rhode Island have been very, very well served. Mm -hmm. Those industry folks have been very well served by the marine spatial planning process, which has accelerated uh, their ability to do that very considerably. Right. Jim, you wanted to chime in. Yeah, I, <clears throat> when I think of information and tech, I tend to put it in two different categories. The first one is the one that we all tend to live in and that we understand well, and that is we have this problem, how can we apply tech or information to solve this? And we do that. Oh, yeah. Speak a little louder, and yeah. Um, two buckets. One, does this work? I, I don't feel that like doesn't that work anymore. either. You're, Just pipe you're out. in the pipe cone out. of silence there. <laughs> There's two, there are two buckets okay. of Nautas. I think of two buckets. One is uh, we have these problems. How can we apply these tech resources? And then this other one is very disruptive. The former is, you know, Surfrider using X to engage people or, you know, do a consumptive study of recreational resources in an area, et cetera. Um, that's interesting. I think that's where we all live. Uh, but that's actually not probably what is – what I think is, is more interesting is the fact that, you know, Visa didn't inv invent the square. <laughs> you know, most disruptive technology comes from somewhere else. And uh, the specific example in my mind is I'm a surfer. I was in Indonesia at a water quality conference. I wanted to surf out front and asked what the water quality was. Let's run some tests. Well, it was a state secret, and the penalty is hanging. <laughs> so from a tech standpoint and from an information standpoint, I'm not going to get sick. I'm going to post something anonymously somewhere and move on, and I'm gone. Um, I think there's a second tier where information and tech will be applied in ways that we don't understand yet. I want to yeah. back on the right whale, and I, was, I yeah. was trying to actually answer your question. Right. And, and, and because it's n an area I know not much about, I, I'll certainly yeah. talk incessantly about it. <laughs> uh, but, but what we have learned over the years, particularly with species and, uh, um, uh, you know, what's out there, one of the best ways, of course, is to get people out there, being able to identify, make a record of where it is. And that's one of the advantages of having an active ocean industries out there, because often they're required to do those kind of studies, to see what's uh, not only, you know, on, this, on the bottom of the sea, but also on the ocean and what they observe. And, and, and as you're implementing the Endangered Species Act, or implementing the Marine Mammal Protection Action, often that is a requirement that that information is given, and that does help with species, their location and mapping, without a doubt. Andy, you want to say something, and then I'll go to my Well, I want to rise to the challenge of the question you asked, which is, is there a more boring acronym than oh, God. marine spatial planning or ecosystem-based management? And I think it is integrated ocean observing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to, exactly. to try to be clear, I want to respond directly to your question, moderator. Um, but the important part of that is integrated um, in that, you know, measuring one property, doing seismic surveys, doing, you know, location of whales, where I actually implemented systems for right whales on um, providing notification on locations, um, is a good thing, but it actually only becomes powerful when two things happen, when it's um, actually integrated with other information, so you can say what happens in a given location to multiple attributes, and secondly, it is openly and transparently available. And so I think one of the points about Jim's story in Indonesia, but the same thing happens here, is it's great if people collect information, whatever it might be, but if it's considered commercially confidential, then it really doesn't help anyone except for the entity that has it commercially confidential. And if it's not related to all of the other information, which we now have the technology to do, but often do not actually do the hard work to do it because it costs money, then it's much less valuable. So while it is perhaps the most boring acronym in the world, integrated observing is incredibly important and it's really foolish not to use the existing technology to do that because it could make a significant difference in how we view the oceans. Okay, and, and then I, I have to say, the, I, this audience may win the award for, first of all, the best questions I've ever received on index cards, which I think stems from how long they are, that people can really <laughs> ponder it, and they're inspired, and they're also extremely feisty. So, so with that, and I can ask these and not have to take any blame, so I'm going to just go straight into these. I'm going to pair a few of them because they are on some similar themes. 
Okay, so we'll we'll start with 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 maybe a little bit of a softball, a couple of different ones, and then and then you guys are going to regret that you yeah. volunteered to be on this, but we'll we'll get there in a minute. So here's one: China has implemented a system of user fees for parties applying to quote do business in the public trust ocean. These fees have generated nearly three billion in funds to support improving the scientific basis for ocean management. Can this ever happen in the U.S.? Second one is the oil and gas industry's royalties paid to the U.S. government for offshore extraction are among the lowest in the world. Can Congress and the administration work together to raise this percentage to cover some of the environmental externalities of pollution, restoration, and oil spills? So on that kind of... I wonder of, who's going to answer exactly, that Exactly. Uh, you, you could start, and, and then everyone else can pile on, or the reverse. You could have everyone else pile on, and, and then you can respond. Thank you much for the opportunity. <laughs> uh, um, uh, user fees uh, actually do take place now. Uh, I mean, uh, and we'll talk about what I know best, and that's the oil, gas, and uh, other ener energy industries. Uh, uh, and we'll, uh, let me just give you an example of oil and gas bidding, say, in the Gulf of Mexico. Say the government offers a lease for sale. Uh, the company pays a bonus bid, and that's a competitive process. That can be billions of dollars sometimes over the course of the year, and it often is every year uh, that comes out of the Gulf of Mexico. Then the lease may be for a term of five, seven, or ten years. During that time, the company pays a rental, meaning in order to maintain the lease, you have to pay so much a year. Should they find oil or gas and have production, then it becomes a royalty, and that is currently is at 18.75%. Uh, I enjoy the discussion of royalties and how it compares to other countries because we often do end up <coughs> comparing apples and oranges. Not all countries have that bidding process. Not all are considered part of that bonus bids. Uh, the United States rates as a rule, and the last time, as I recall, the government did a study that they were competitive worldwide. But there is that fund, and it's a giant fund. Uh, uh, there have been 10 to 15 billion dollars in some years that's been generated as a result of oil and natural gas uh, production and buying. Of but it doesn't end up, it goes, it goes into the general treasury, it doesn't it, end up going to the It can go to the general treasury. I mean, again, we'll go back to Congress determines sure. where it goes. Uh, industry doesn't determine where sure. it goes. And, and you've got uh, a share of the states. I mean, if it's onshore, you get a share of the states. There will be a share going to more coastal states, and if the FAIR Act is passed, an additional uh, amount will go there. Uh, there is uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund is funded completely by offshore oil and gas monies. And, and again, it's up to Congress of how much to do that. But that still leaves a pretty good chunk of where Congress wants to put it. Some of it goes back into research. Uh, when I was at MMS, uh, uh, we had uh, millions of dollars spent every year on uh, studying of the Arctic area as well as other ocean areas. It was scientific research. So that, again, I don't want to pass the buck necessarily, but some of that does, is determined where Congress says. But there is a pretty good source of funds out there. Mike, you wanted to weigh in probably about what your members are helping. Yeah, I, I would. I can't help anyone talk about a user fee. I have to pipe up a little bit here because while I'm proud of the Chinese for contributing three billion dollars, um, you know, puny little anglers and boaters kick in a billion and a half a year and have been doing it for many, many years towards aquatic cons conservation. And my members in user fees, excise taxes on fishing tackle, pay well in excess of $100 million every year that goes back to aquatic conservation. So, you know, when I... When and that I, other, that billion, that $1.5 billion, where, how is that going, how is that being funneled into aquatic conservation? Where Are they paying it to the combination of, I mean, the states, or how, and how, how does that happen? Well, a portion of it goes to the states, a portion of it is administered by the Department of Interior. Okay. So states for fish and wildlife conservation. Got it. Uh, everything from... Uh, Pump outs in in in, um, in 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 marinas on goes to, to help boating make it you know improve the waterways etc. Um, so I, I I tend to think that from a recreation perspective we figured this out a long long time ago recreational fishing I should say back in 1950 this statute got started mm -hmm. and it got started largely because folks realized that we wanted fish populations to be abundant. And the truth is, not everybody cares about fish populations. Our industry did. And we knew without strong, abundant fish populations, we were out of business. So since 1950, there have been excise taxes on, uh, on um, fishing tackle. And in 84, through John Bro and Malcolm Wallop helped change that fund to, from Dingle Johnson to, um, to, to the Wallop Bro Fund.
Senator. The point that I would jump in on your yeah. question, Juliet, is that um, <coughs> if you, when you talked about the Chinese, what you said is that they raised that money and they plowed it back into the ocean resource. And as the other questioners have indicated, a lot of the money that we get out of our coastal industries does not go back to the coast. Indeed, the lion's share goes to terrestrial purposes. There is a colossal transfer of wealth that takes place from coastal states to upland and particularly to western states through the way that over many years Congress has gotten used to allocating this money. There have been some very, very powerful western senators who have made sure that they uh, got a big chunk of the coastal revenues. And so working that back to the point where the revenues that are generated in the ocean and coastal areas go back to support the ocean and coastal areas is the big step that we need to begin to take. And because it's a zero-sum game, that's going to be a continuing battle. But it's a battle that, as a representative of an ocean state, in fact, the ocean state by our nomenclature, <laughs> uh, I'm exactly. keen, keenly looking forward to because it's a huge transfer of wealth away from coastal states towards landlocked states. There we go. We could say blame Wyoming, where we happen to have someone from Wyoming on our panel, but we're not going to do that because Randall's just getting, you know, he's on the defensive too much. So we're going to move on, and now we're going to ask two climate-related <coughs> questions. Uh, Senator Whitehouse, you mentioned you want to see leadership from the Obama administration. What would this leadership look like? And will the next president uh, have an easier time pushing for a strong climate-slash-ocean policy? And in the case of fisheries, quoting Mike Nussman, um, uh, we bit the bullet and made difficult changes. In the case of climate change, we, have, we seem to think we can dodge the bullet. What will it take to get the public and our leaders to bite the bullet on climate change? Yeah. On the, I'll, I'll answer you the executive answer part of the question and then let other people have a crack. Yeah. The two major things that the executive branch can do are to act utilizing their existing regulatory authorities, primarily under the Clean Air Act, finish the new power plants rule, finalize that, stand up and impose a existing power plants rule, um, <coughs> which would, should include large power plants that are not run just for the generation of power, but for run for industrial purposes, um, and then to <coughs> adjust the way in which the federal government does its purchasing, which they can do pretty much on their own, so that supply chain carbon costs are taken into account. Those would make a colossal difference. Indeed, I believe they would make <coughs> such a difference that the industries involved would at that point come very quickly to Congress to say the regulatory way is not an efficient way for this to take place and it's 100 percent on us. We've got to fix our plants and there's no revenue to help. A better way to solve this problem is with a carbon pollution fee or something like that so that there's some revenue that's generated and then we can take a piece of that revenue to deal with the particular costs that we and our customers will face while we try to correct this market anomaly in the economy. So that's a, it's an absolutely critical step and I think that the, uh, I think and hope that the Obama administration is getting ready to step up and do that. Um, other thoughts, that, does anyone have any other thoughts of, you know, what might galvanize people? We've well, talked think, about some disasters, uh, extreme weather. Does yeah. this work, testing? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's different everywhere. You know, I think of Miami, uh, you know, under sea level. I don't know how many people in, uh, in the state of Florida are at very low sea levels. And then I live in a tiny beach community in San Diego, <coughs> Solana Beach, with 40-foot vertical sea walls. The entire coast is 40 foot feet of seawall. So at mid-tide to high tide, there is no beach. So when someone calls and asks me, what's your favorite beach in your hometown? There isn't one. I go to another town to go to the beach. And I think over time, people are starting to get their head around, OK, this is real. This isn't some political CNN talking head thing. This is actually me as a citizen living in my town in Port Orford, Oregon, or in Nantucket. It's real, and it's hitting the citizens. Two things. I think, um, in addition to certainly agreeing with the, using the vehicles that already exist, I do think we actually have to have an energy strategy. Uh, and with respect, an all of the above strategy is a nothing in particular. 
strategy. So I do actually think that there needs to be an energy strategy, which includes um, a, a direct consideration of carbon. Whether that ends up being a price on carbon or not is depends on what that strategy is. But there actually needs to be a way to transition um, the existing system to something else. And secondly, I strongly agree with, with Jim. The, you, you do have to focus the country on impacts and the consequences uh, of those impacts on infrastructure. I mean, how much of the nation's transportation infrastructure um, is in a coastal zone, in a floodplain, that is going to be underwater, and how long does it take to rebuild that infrastructure? Um, how much of the um, nation's uh, economy depends on some of the impacts that are occurring, whether through severe weather events, um, through to droughts, to wildfires, and so on. And I, I don't think that that requires entirely new legislation, but it does require new action. And hopefully then the legislation will follow to say, actually, there's a better way to do this, as the senator pointed out. Um, and then I'm going to go back to questions, but I wanted to ask one more of my own so we make sure we get it, which is about the Arctic. Mm -hmm. um, and talk about it as, you know, kind of the continent that never was. Um, why, why, you know, how do you all view this issue, which obviously is, is very tied to kind of what's happening with the ocean, but also is, is in many ways kind of an out of sight, out of mind issue when it comes to policymaking, Roger? Yeah, well, I'd like to tie it into the technology question a little bit okay. because we, I do agree that technology can be a big, uh, a big uh, step forward in terms of trying to protect the oceans and do things more safely in the oceans than we did in the past. But I think it can also lull you into a, a sense of security. And we did that, I think, in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. We thought we could drill in a, in, a, in, a, in a mile deep, and we had the technology there that would, that would be able to stop a, an oil well that, that ran free and be able to prevent it from happening in the first place. And we were wrong. Yeah. And I hope we don't make the same mistake in the Arctic. You know, I, I buy into the fact mm -hmm. that we're going to be drilling up there. If we don't, somebody else is going to be drilling up there. Uh, but we need to, uh, you, somebody said, uh, externalities. Mm -hmm, right. I kind of remember that from uh, some college course I had in <laughs> something. But economics, maybe. Yeah, economics, maybe. But I, I, I do think the oil industry has to bear all the externalities. And part of the externalities is to make sure that before we drill in the Arctic, that we be damn sure we can do it safely and environmentally, in an environmentally safe way. And that in, in, involves Arctic-specific standards for the technology we use, backup systems, uh, 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 a uh, ability to drive a relief well, drive, drive a relief well in a, in a reasonable period of time, stop before the season gets closed in on you. So it's, it's, it's going to be very expensive, and I think that'll help with the climate thing, because if, we, if, if, uh, if, we're, if the cost of drilling for oil mm -hmm. is at the price it should be, because of all the costs that it should entail to, dry, to, to, to drill in the Arctic and other places, then that'll help, I think, with uh, us driving to different technologies for solving our, uh, our uh, energy needs in the future. But, and I'm curious, so does everyone on the panel, do you accept this, that, that the U.S. should be drilling in the Arctic, other people, you know, the Norwegians, the, you know, every, everyone else is drilling, we should, no. uh, Andy, what's your, what's your thought on that? Well, I don't accept that we should just assume that it will be, you know, the next Wild West. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there is an opportunity to again do something different. Now, if that ultimately means there will be some, some drilling, maybe it does. But without a strategy, I don't think it really makes any sense to simply say, well, it's going to kind of go along as ever it goes, and people will move into what is, again, a public trust resource and do what they like to do, whether it's drilling or shipping or tourism. Mm -hmm. I mean, who is going to bear the cost of a major tourism industry opening up in the Arctic with the things that go along with that, which can be, now we have to have search and rescue capabilities. Is that going to be funded by the tourism industry? I, it isn't in the Antarctic. Um, you know, so we can assume that it will just go in an unfettered way, or somebody else will do it, the Russians will do it, so we might as well just get there before them. But I, th that seems to be a, f a foolish starting premise. Um, so I, it's not like I have a, you know, pocket Arctic plan, um, but I don't think that it's impossible to actually negotiate one. We don't have one right now. It's seven, you know, Arctic coastal states but the rest of the world also has a, an interest in the Arctic. So before we take that step of just saying, well, you know, hopefully you'll do it safely, why don't we actually figure out as a global community what it makes sense to do as opposed to just allowing it to develop and then pick up the pieces afterwards? Yeah. You might think I might disagree just a tiny bit, but uh, one is I, I think the mini oil and gas industry, the Arctic has not been a, a forgotten country. 
-hmm. by any means. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, for many great. in the oil and gas industry, uh, the Arctic has, is certainly not a forgotten country. It's something that of great interest, great uh, concern. Uh, and many companies have been in, not necessarily the United States, but outside the United States, have been actively involved in near Arctic areas uh, for many, many years. And it isn't done in an unfettered, willy-nilly way. I mean, if you just took what is in place even a year ago under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, under the other various acts that are there, there is, it's an organized, planned, the government has to be involved in it, uh, session, it's a step-by-step -step process. And as a rule, the government says, before we'll grant this permit, you've got to show to us you can do it safely. Now, where the burden then comes back on industry is exactly that. No one in the oil and gas industry wants an accident. You know, please be assured of that. No one does. The loss of life is, no well is worth the loss of a life. The economic and potential environmental hazards, no one in the industry wants that. It is going to be done cautiously. Government plays a, should play a very active role in making sure that it is done wisely and carefully. The Arctic is an area that's of, of great in interest to, I think, everybody. And, and I agree, I think the whole panel agrees, that if it's going to be developed, it needs to be developed wisely. And I think the, if the, I think most of the measures are in place now, and there's also additional measures being taken right now to assure that. If I could, yes, I, I would like to add to that, and and I we don't have a Arctic. I was going to say, We've I know uh, the anglers have the not Arctic. made it up there yet. I've never taken my center console up there for the weekend, and I, <laughs> at least in the future, don't think I'll be doing that. But but I do think, whether it's a storm or it's an oil spill or some other activity, we're going to have accidents in the future. We're, things are going to screw up. Yep. If we do anything, things are going to screw up. That's just the nature of the beast. We can't be so cautious that we don't try, that we don't work hard at understanding. That doesn't mean willy-nilly. It doesn't mean don't pay attention, just go in and make it wild, wild west. Um, that's not what I'm advocating. But I also don't want people to think that we can reduce risk to zero. That's not possible. Um, okay, so now we're going to, th th these are not questions I uh, expected, but I've got two of them, so I'm going to throw them out there. A startling observation of this leadership panel is that it is all men. Do you feel like there is a need for women in leadership roles in this field? And can you speak to why there is a need for women uh, leadership roles? And wait, and then, uh, oh shoot, and then there was another basically decrying you. Apparently, I, I, since I'm not a leader, um, this is an all-male panel. Um, and please comment, no, but, but obviously it speaks, it speaks to a, a, a real issue. So anyway, there's one other just blaming you I all will, for being white men. I will, I will speak and we'll offer the fact that I don't think any of us put the panel together, so. <laughs> Let me, uh, so we okay, agree. Why don't, why don't we engage? Juliet. Yes. Juliet. We agree. Juliet. I was going to say, just a good speech to that, yes. My wife is a marine biologist. Yes. Uh, I just left the State Department. Sylvia Earle is probably the lead oceans scientist in the public world, female. Uh, Catherine Sullivan is the current uh, head of NOAA. Acting, acting director she of NOAA. She was preceded by Jane Lubchenco as the previous administrator of NOAA. I think this uh, is an area in which our panel is an unfortunate anomaly because women have a very, very significant role in this area and um, I think find it an incredibly rewarding place to work. Got it. Okay. I would just offer that all the women were probably too busy doing real work to come and participate, and they sent okay. us instead. Okay, legitimate. Okay, anyway. All right, moving on. Um, what role or activity should we as citizens slash scientists slash government employees do to further the climate change solution and bring more action to ocean protection? What are people's thoughts on that? I think Maybe, uh, yeah, Jim, can I'm going to start with that. I, do I need, are we passing this now? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Check, check. Seems to have been a general meltdown. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. Hello, Cleveland. Um, I think uh, a good uh, one of my favorite words is on ramps. Uh, uh, people need on ramps to connect to meaningful causes, and I think it's way too high friction of an ask to say you don't have any interest in the environment. Let me talk to you about ocean acidification. 
you already you lost me, you know, eight words ago. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that Surfrider works with people like Jack Johnson, and we're literally on his last two global tours. Um, because you have a mouthpiece, but then you also have local citizens talking to other people that like music. Um, so I think we, we all need to find on-ramps, places to plug people in, in ways that aren't too big of a stretch for them. They're already at the 930 Club tonight to see Beach House, which is playing. We should be there. Um, we need to find ways to plug people in. And once you start to understand and you start to deal with single-use plastics, and a kudos to the group for transitioning out of the plastic bottles, you've been bitten. And then it grows, and then it grows, and you become more alert. But I think, I think it's, uh, it's a progressive curve. It's not exponential. All right, Heather. Andy. Um, just to the last question yes. about what would be the consequences of having women on the panel instead of all men, I think it would be a better panel. <laughs> um, so it's a short answer. The, um, to this one, I think it's a, a, about what people should do is it's actually you should demand government action and you should demand private sector action. Um, you know, it, it's not sufficient to simply say, oh, you know, Congress can't get anything done or the administration is going to be too slow. It's just not sufficient to do that. So the, the people have information sources available to them and they can exercise their, their voice and their rights in this country to ask for action, not just assume that nothing can get done. Um, and I think a lot of people in this room, of course, are in that kind of activist frame. It doesn't mean everyone's going to go demonstrate around the Capitol, but you can actually say, no, we actually want EPA to take action with the existing authority when all this noise is going on about, oh, that'll just kill all the jobs, um, and so, so forth. So I do think that there is a real role, and it's called citizenship. Engage citizenship. Yeah. And don't underestimate the power of one on this one. The idea of our individual conservation efforts ourselves. Right. You know, that's actually made a difference in the last few years for most of the developing countries in terms of at least one aspect when we talk about climate change, reduction of uh, CO2. And a lot of that's been done on an individual basis. Don't ever forget how important each one of us are. Okay. So uh, a couple of questions having to do with connected to disasters, both in terms of their impact on opinions, but also what they might mean uh, for you know, conservation and, and funding. So one is, do you think that disasters can serve as catalysts for change through environmental policies? If so, how can these policies be implemented after attention moves away from the disaster as time passes? In other words, oil spills and extreme weather. And uh, question about the role of coastal habitat within the current budget climate. How can we all work to advance coastal habitat restoration and protection with benefits for both fisheries and coastal communities? And certainly in that, I would encourage folks to talk about, say, uh, BP oil fund and, and other things. So in that, where, where do we see maybe opportunities out of disaster, I guess is the way one would put it. Well, I think just the, the, uh, the American people have a very short attention span, you know, and so the disaster is a big deal. It's on the front page. It's, it's outrage. You know, we watch the, uh, the uh, Deepwater Horizon spill on, you know, constantly on, uh, on a website spilling oil at, uh, that, you know, a mile below for months at a time. People are outraged over it. And, uh, and what's happened since then? I think it's off everybody's radar screen. You know, it, 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 they dispersed a lot of it down below. We don't, want the long, don't know what the long-term effects are, but there wasn't a lot of uh, black oil on the beaches, so that reduced the, the emphasis as well. And I just think, uh, you know, that uh, we're on to the next disaster. So I don't think it's a prescription for long-term uh, action at all. I don't think it's a prescription, but I think it's an assist. Um, you know, when I think, I lived in New York City before 9-11, and then going there after 9-11, New York City's different. The, the, the tone is a different place. Um, and. New York City and Sandy hitting and Mayor Bloomberg comparing single-use plastic bags to lead paint. Going through the economic drivers, going through everything. Uh, that's leadership and that's people saying, okay, this is in our, we didn't ask for this to be in our, uh, you know, conversation, but we're talking about this and let's talk about this. Why do we need a single-use plastic bag for one single use? Really? How, why do we need that? Isn't that actually a sign of a 
failing society and then someone like a Bloomberg putting it out there and comparing it to lead paint. My sense is these are assists if we use them well, and that was my brand point earlier. Um, there's a good silver lining to disasters. They bring, they, they question us, they shake us. That's good. Single use plastic bag lining to disasters. I'm gonna try to use that metaphor. Okay, on fisheries, given a successful stock rebuilding in the last 10 years, what are the most important issues looking forward to the next 10 years for fisheries management? So what, what would you put up there? I'll I'm be glad to, to start with yes. that one. Uh, I think, um, you know, as I said previously, biologically we've proven we can rebuild stocks. We've, we've moved in the right direction. And to me that's really important to do. What we've not done uh, is, from my perspective, is figured out how to best use those fish, fish resources from time to time. I mean, for a long time we talked about overfishing. Now I've heard the word underfishing. In fact, the Magnuson Act calls for us to use those resources and use them well. And we think that's really going to be the challenge. How do we have the science? How do we have the information to properly fish, to fish smartly in a way that, that, that takes the fish out that are appropriate but doesn't overfish? Knowing full well, we're going to screw up sometimes. That's the nature of, of making things happen. You just, you're, not, you're not always going to, humans don't have the ability to be perfect, at least I don't. In Rhode, uh, I in Rhode Island, we're seeing um, sector management really begin to take hold and fishermen really beginning to see the value of it and those who were you early fine sector management uh, catch share oh, okay, type okay, uh, market mini market programs right. uh, in which you can kind of trade a little bit what your allocation is it makes it much more efficient it makes it easier <coughs> it saves fishing days fuel lives all of that it's a very uh, sensible program and we've seen the early adopters begin to actually reap real rewards from it and the people who are skeptical are starting to look over at their colleagues and saying hey maybe that'll work so there's a more efficient way to do that um, and I think that's coming online we also need to be a lot better about de-siloing all the different stocks mm -hmm. because when one crashes something else moves into that ecological space and we haven't been good about figuring out how that interrelation works um, and what you might want to actually open up a lot to try to uh, get rid of, like dogfish in New England, uh -huh. so that more welcome species can reemerge more rapidly. And the third thing is That's that... That's just you maligning sharks right there, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm going to call you thing. out on that, but go ahead, move on. And the third, Everyone just likes too to many blame the dogfish. All right. There are just too many of them. Um, and the third is that we have got to improve the way in which the scientists and the fishermen work together. So when uh, Captain Rule comes up in his boat, he's a well-regarded fisherman, and takes Virginia Institute of Marine Science fisher scientists out on his boat, and together they trawl and gather the information, mm -hmm. that is a much more credible uh, arrangement than when Noah sends out a boat and every fisherman in Rhode Island says, they may be good scientists, they don't know how to fish. Mm -hmm. All their data stinks because they don't know how to fish. They got the trawl upside down, they're going too fast, they're going the wrong direction vis-a-vis -vis the tide. I can fish right next to them and catch twice as much they can't possibly be telling the truth. And you get this enormous, very virulent conflict between the fishing community and the scientific community. And as soon as that distrust gets broken down, and I think those other two mechanisms allow it to happen, we'll have a much, much better environment for that. If we're going to talk cooperation, and mic. I, I okay, but now you, I've been told you have to use the mic, so I'm sorry. I'm, I'm gonna right. we're going to talk get that mic in your We're going to talk and, cooperation, yes, which yeah. I'm glad we are. But, uh, and this is one that certainly Mike and I know quite a bit about, uh, well, have worked on it. I don't know about quite a bit about. But you know, uh, oil and gas have production platforms. They're often in in, uh, in place for many, many years as long as there's production. What we have found in the Gulf of Mexico is many of these platforms have actually been transferred into essential and important habitat uh, for many species of fish and coral. And so it's been an, an interesting, and, and now as some of those production platforms are no longer being used, 
uh, under the lease terms and under the law, they're required to be removed. And, and we're getting into some very interesting conversations with sports fishermen and uh, divers about actually leaving those facilities in place or a portion thereof because they have actually enhanced the habitat. And that's one area where I think the scientists, both on industry, the fishermen, the government, that's one area I think we could actually really start to work together on and see what kind of habitat is, if it's useful habitat, and what, er and what places you might want to leave those or where they should be put. Did you want to I, I would just second that. That's been a, a, a program that the, this administration has stepped forward on and has helped us mm -hmm. uh, liaison between the two communities. And I think we've had good conversations and we've made real progress. You know, of course, with the Department of Interior involved and Bessie, uh, it's just been a it's a win win deal there. Got it. And Andy, go ahead. So I agree with some of He's the loud. comments He's about loud. changing in mic, fisheries. But... I, I think <laughs> my, my mic is working. Um, I have a fishery management council voice anyway. The, uh, so I agree with some of the comments, certainly not maligning both dogs and sharks Thank you. in the same sentence. But, um, the, uh, um, but I think actually in terms of the question about, so what's next, yeah. it really is um, trying to uh, s stop treating fisheries as if it's separate and in part and not in the ocean with a whole bunch of other things. Um, which is detrimental to fishermen, uh, both recreational and commercial, and uh, is also detrimental to a lot of other activities. I mean, we treat fisheries as if it's its own little world, um, and it isn't. Um, and so, again, we can go back to the boring phrases of, of spatial planning or ecosystem-based management, but in fact, it's important to think through, so how do you actually figure out, how do we have a vibrant fishing industry in a place like California where it's really difficult to do that any longer because of the value of coastal property and the other activities that are happening on the ocean and make that as a conscious decision about what we actually want to do with the ocean both in preservation as well as in in use and and secondly I think the, the there again is a huge challenge of trying to create management systems that still work um, in improving sustainability when we know that the environment is no longer stationary in statistical terms, in other words, no longer constant mean. So now we're going to have stocks shifting, we're going to have productivity shifting. Um, and if you have a rigid management system that might work wonderfully for 1995, there's nothing saying that it will still work or the protected area that you created in 2000 is in the right place for 2015 or, or 2020. And what that it, it goes back to some of the issues about programs like cat shares uh, to try to provide some flexibility which is not flexibility to overexploit but flexibility to actually adjust the systems and the fisheries at the same time and that is very very difficult to do not because the scientific information isn't there but because it you know people are not very good at, at accepting change or allowing the conditions to change for a whole host of reasons right and and mike you wanted to i, I, I want to come in because Typically, when we talk about ocean, most of the focus is on commercial fishing, and perhaps it, in some ways, I would argue it should be. The commercially, we, they, the commercial industry takes about 98% of all the fish caught. Recreationally, we take about 2% if you look at all the salt water. Um, but one thing we've not done, and I've never heard, and this not, isn't just fishing, but it's all recreation. If we, if we sat and we talked and we said, does anyone have a vision of what coastal marine recreation should look like? I don't think anybody has that vision. That's right. We don't at ASA for a fishing perspective. And I don't think, while we may talk about energy policy, whether we agree or disagree, or we may talk about health care policy, I, I, other than me saying it, have never heard the term recreation policy. Yet, recreation is phenomenally important as an economic driver um, in the oceans and everywhere else, but we're just talking oceans here too. And it just seems it needs to get a little more respect. Um, there used to be an ocean, a recreation council. Uh, Jim Watt killed it back in the 80s. And I, one thing I'd do is I think we need to think a little more about is there a place for recreation, an elevation of recreation uh, in the federal government. Okay. Lastly, I'll add th thanks to Jane Lubchenco and some sort of work she did and she's pushed through. We're looking at economic numbers now in NOAA that suggests that there are more jobs created 
by recreation, recreational fishing, than there are by commercial fishing. That's ours. Now those are NOAA numbers. Yeah. And that's to me, that's, if we catch 2% of the fish, and we're pr providing pretty much the same amount of jobs, and we want to maximize jobs, I'd have to look at some things like reallocation of fish stocks. Sure. Though doesn't that show that you're just not as good at fishing? I mean, isn't that it the does. bottom it, line? It is. That's my takeaway. And we're <laughs> more than willing to Which buy is, all kinds of gear. Yeah, and to not do junk, as well. You know? Right, and, and, yeah, yeah. and it's good for the environment. All right, that's seriously, that's your secret weapon, but I, I don't think they want to admit it that loudly. Well, okay, last, last question. Can climate adaptation efforts, such as building resilience for coastal communities and adopting fisheries management for warming waters, serve a secondary purpose by bringing new perspectives and new constituencies into the call for action on mitigation. How else do you impact congressional and public opinion? So I'm wondering if you guys could take this as our final question. We're running out of time about maybe some of the new voices. I mean, the senator referred to it in the beginning on climate, but as we're looking at what's happening to our coasts and our oceans, do you see kind of new people engaging, and is that changing the conversation to some extent? Senator. You see, um, I think, not only new people, but also some uh, new ideas and new information. Mm -hmm. The uh, blue carbon report that just came out might be an interesting example, uh, showing that actually a lot of carbon gets drawn out and sequestered by coastal features like mangrove swamps, uh, seagrass, uh, coastal features um, like coastal wetlands. And those also have very considerable value to the people who live around them as part of the natural environment. So. When, if you could get to the point where you could actually put a carbon value on restoring those things, now you have a, not only the sort of carbon constituency, but you've got the local folks who want the seagrass there because it's nurseries for fish, want the uh, local um, coastal features preserved, the uh, wetlands that are so important. You've got a win-win going on between the local interest in preserving the coastline and its traditional features and those who are trying to take advantage of the carbon sequestration properties of those. But you need to link that and you need information and data to make that case. Other, other thoughts on new constituencies, new people coming? Go ahead, Andy. So I do think that there are new constituencies. I think it goes back to the disaster question a little bit. I mean, I think the disaster... Um, uh, disasters that we've seen have focused attention not just in the communities where that's occurred, uh, but across the country. And of course, it has an enormous economic cost for the country as a whole, as well as a certainly a localized cost. And so I think there's an opportunity for people to look at um, what some of the ongoing effects are, not, not just in the coastal communities themselves, but how that affects the nation. And it will come home in infrastructure. It'll come home in you know, farming practices under drought scenarios and so on to a much greater extent than we currently um, sort of see integration from land and sea. Um, and I, that's sort of what I meant by um, stopping thinking of fisheries as if it's in isolation from everything else because, of course, it isn't. So there is a real opportunity to start to think more clearly about um, what those connections are. Okay, and we are now going to, uh, that's, uh, that's our last comment. I want you to join me in thanking our all-white male panel for rising <laughs> above its limitations. <laughs> I, got a, I got a third part at the end. <laughs>